Okay, Kevin. So I guess the first question is why? <laughs> Have you got about two days? <laughs> It actually started when I was a little kid. Um, I had a fascination for, for nature. And as I got older, the, the animals just got bigger and bigger. And what actually started out as pretty much self-indulgence when it came to lions, because I met these two little lion cubs at a safari park, and I fell in love with them. And I thought to myself, I just can't wait for this lion to get to an age where I can actually embrace him and put my head in his big, you know, fat, fluffy mane. And... But soon after, you know, the, the relationship started with these two guys, which Really? That's what you said? I can't wait for them to grow up so I can... Yeah, it was all about me, and it was <laughs> about getting a picture with this big lion, and it would be fantastic to show all my friends, and it would be, you know, it was really about that. And soon after meeting them and, and actually um, getting to know lions in a way that most others don't ever get the opportunity to do, I realized that there was so much more to it. And, and it wasn't just about my self-indulgence. I realized that lions were actually facing a, a predicament. And that 100 years ago, we had 450,000 lions roaming in, Af in Africa. And to date, that number's dropped down to 20,000. Um, so as I was doing all these crazy things with lions, um, so my recognition was, was advancing and people were starting to take notice. And I realized that there was a lot that I could do. So, so there's obviously the, the problem of uh, conservation of lions. H how much of your interest in this is uh, connected to the danger? Let's say they had no teeth and no claws. They were just like, I don't know, um, what, what else could be? They were, they were just friendly to everybody. Would, would it be as, a, as attractive for you or as the, the danger? Yeah, I suppose it's a good question because um, if there weren't um, these, these animals that had the potential to kill you, would I be as fascinated with them? Would everyone be as fascinated with them? You know, and I think that is the, that is the question because why do people want to hunt them? Um, they are classified as one of the big five. And for those of you who don't know why they're called the big five, it's because they were the most dangerous animals to hunt in Africa. So maybe they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be in the situation that they're in if they didn't have these big teeth and these big claws. You know? but, but we're talking about your psychology. So, <laughs> so I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> you did, but you yes, did a there's, job. A, there's a fascination, as, again, since a kid with things that, that are potentially dangerous, uh, like spotted hyenas it, that's in the background there. So yes, there's this fascination, and I suppose it's uh, something that has intrigued me about them. And, and are, you, are you still afraid when you're dealing with them, or now are you looking for more frightening things to, to... <laughs> No, I think lions are quite enough. Um, actually, over the years, um, it is, I, I, I use the analogy, it's like a, a pilot just getting his license. He's at his most dangerous when he gets that license. And then as he accumulates hours of flying, he gains experience. And you basically start with a, a bucket empty of experience and a bucket full of luck. And you better hope that when the one runs out, the other's full. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it really much is like that with lions. You know, all, all of my close calls were, were really when, when I was young and naive and thought I could conquer the world. So early on in my career of working with lions. But as, as I've worked with them now over well over 16 years, and I'm still around and I haven't been eaten, people start to you know, say, well, maybe he does know something about these, these animals. You know? So, yeah. so what, what were some of your close calls? Well, I was attacked by a, a, a male lion um, quite early on. I'd known these two cubs and I'd, I'd raised them. And I felt sorry for this particular lion because he had come from a facility where he had, was kept as a pet. And um, he was declawed. This is a phenomenon that happens still to this day where people want to have this relationship with these animals so they defang them or they declaw them. And I felt sorry for him because he had been showered with his love as a youngster. And then when he got too big, he had been declawed. And then he was still dangerous. Um, and so he got tossed aside like a used oil rag. And he landed up at our park. And so I used to interact with him through the fence because I thought he had this human connection. And eventually convinced myself that I could communicate with him. And I went in with him. And, and I got away with it for months on end until my, my nephew's eighth birthday party at the park where he wanted me to go in with this line. And I'd made some rules about it to myself about how I would interact with him. And on this particular day, he wouldn't come up to the fence and so I decided to go in with him, and, and he sorted me so out. So this was kind of showing up to your eight-year-old Correct, nephew? exactly. It was basically under uh, peer pressure, and uh, the whole family. From an eight-year-old? From an eight-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and the family, uh, the family surrounding the eight-year-old and all the expectations, no, no. yeah. So, so you, you go in, and? I go in, and he, he, just, he was just biding his time, waiting for me to get beyond a point where he knew that there wasn't enough time for me to get out in time. And he just sat there looking, looking, looking until I reached that mark, and then he got up ran towards me. And even though he was declawed, he still came down and gave me a huge smack on the, on the face, which caused an instant nosebleed. 
Um, I don't remember much what happened uh, from there, but when I did come around, I was in the middle of his area. So I'd moved about 15, 20 meters, and he was proceeding to bite me in various areas of my body. Um, and the thing about a lion is, you know, almost a cat and mouse. When you move, then they do something, you know, especially when he's in this situation. And so I wasn't moving, but when I did come around, I thought, crikey, I've got to do something here and get out of here. Um, and luckily, there was a guy at, who, who worked with me at the time who came in and tried to help me and diverted his attention. So he left me alone to go for him, and I managed to get up and get out. So he was in a bad mood in general. It wasn't just you. He would, he would attack anybody that day. No, he, you know, the thing was is back then I didn't really realize about the, the, the behavior, the psychology of a lion. And uh, you know, as now knowing what I know now, it was really about his territory and, and you going in there. And he wasn't trying to kill me because if a lion tries to kill you, even without claws, he's going to just do it in one bite. So it was really a, a, a thing about, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm bigger than you, and this is my turf, and you're coming in here and trying to throw your weight around, I'll teach you a lesson, which he did. Which, and, and, and how long did you learn that lesson? What? Well, it was after working with lions for about a year, a year and a half, so it was an early lesson, and a, I call it a lucky lesson, and you know, I did learn from it. And, and, and did you make up with this particular lion? Well, I did, but uh, the relationship with lions, it's, it's like any relationship, it needs constant work. Um, and no surprise if, if what you put in is what, what comes out. But um, a lot of the time with big mature lines is that they, they lose their, their want to form relationships after a certain age. And he was at, at that age where he wasn't quite sure of my intentions and I wasn't quite sure of his, so we decided to call it a day. <laughs> and <laughs> you, moved, you moved to other lions. Yeah, well, I'd be, all the, all, in that time I had been working with other lions too, so they were all getting big and the family was growing. And, and so... You know, I got to a point where I realized that, uh, what was I doing? Um, it was a situation where I was faced with, you can't keep on keeping all these lines. And, and, and this facility that I was at was part of an industry whereby these lines are bred and then the, the, paying, uh, the paying tourist market will come there and pet them and take pictures with them. And I only found out in a, at a later stage what actually happens to these cats once they get too big. And it's a phenomenon in South Africa that's a huge problem called uh, canned hunting. And for those of you who don't know what canned hunting is, it's really about a lion that's been raised in a captive environment and then it's released into an area where you can't even call it hunting because it doesn't have a chance of fair escape. And then a hunter will come out from wherever in the world to pay a, 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 a sum to shoot it. Basically like uh, clubbing seals or you know, fishing with dynamite. Um, and that's, that's something that I campaign quite strongly for, uh, well against. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it brings, brings me around the world. Um so, so as you've learned so much about lions' uh, behavior and psychology, are there things in their behavior or psychology that you admire that you say, I wish people were more like that? I do. I, th I think uh, they, they live a very simple life, a very simplistic life. They don't take more than they need, and they utilize their environment very well. Um, and I think most people could take, out of a, uh, take a leaf out of a lion's book on that, uh, on that score. There's not, but there's not much to buy. So you know, it could have been that if we started uh, opening uh, real estate agencies and <laughs> banks, they would have behaved differently. Exactly. <laughs> and, and are there particular things in their behavior that you that you wish you could have changed? Well, the one I think the one thing that always comes to mind with the male line is they need to learn to share. <laughs> That's a really bad attribute. With are, there, are the females sharing? The problem? females are more caring and more sharing. And um, they, they 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 grow up in this. Uh, you know, they're the only truly social cat. Most people don't know that. But there's no other cat out there, and it's a very interesting thing, and uh, scientists are still trying to figure out why. Uh, why, in their evolutionary pathway, did they um, form these societies? And uh, it's, it's been a very good, good way of, of, of living in the African savannah. Um, and why did other big cats not, not follow suit? Um, so there are, the cheetah is a, a cat that does show some signs of, of socialness, but not like the lion. Um, so sharing is, an, is, is one thing that I think male lions need to figure out. So, so how do the females share and what do the males do in contrast? Well, the, the females would, would um, t typically, um, also again, contrary to popular belief, male lions do hunt quite a bit. They don't just uh, become the king of the jungle and then lie down, sit back oh, and, good to yeah, know. and take the lion's share. Well, they do take the lion's share when, when the kills are made, but they have, a far, they have an important job and that's to patrol the real estate. Because without the real estate, there's, there's, nothing, um, there's nothing for the family to eat, so to speak. But the females will go and hunt, and they'll bring down the prey, and uh, they'll share it out. Everyone will get their full. But if a male lion's there, he'll just chase everyone off, especially if the prey is too uh, small to go around. He doesn't care that they can all starve or they can go and hunt something else. He's going to eat that, and he's going to protect it. 
so the male is going to eat that uh, particular prey and not share with anybody. Not share with anyone else. Yeah, especially if it's not big enough. If it's big enough, then then he doesn't care. Then he'll get his full. Yeah. But then then they've had enough, and then they it, it's not considered sharing if you don't have to sacrifice anything. Exactly. <laughs> so so yeah. is it fair to say that they are much more selfish than the females? I would say, yeah, I think they, and, and it's probably they geared that way because they have to protect uh, the, the, the territory and have to be strong to ward off any potential rivals. That's a yeah. rationalization of their <laughs> behavior. Um, so, so I want to go back a little bit to your own uh, risk taking. So one of the things we see with all kinds of uh, behaviors is that you have behaviors with low probability of happening. So think about something like texting and driving and the probability that you will text and drive and something bad would happen is relatively low. Let's say it's 2%. So one day you text and drive and nothing bad happens. But at the end of that, you don't say to yourself, oh my goodness, I was lucky. You say probably the probability was less than 2%. Maybe yeah. it was 1.5%. And then you do it again and again and again, and you keep on taking sure. uh, uh, extra, extra risk. And there is this vicious cycle where things that have low probability of happening, when bad, the probability of bad things happening is very low, there's a chance that people would uh, become extra uh, basically not worried at all, extra, yes. extra overconfident because of that. Sure. And are you, are you experiencing some of that uh, cycle? As you, I mean, you know, these no, no, are incredibly good, dangerous animals. It's a very good question and it's a fair question. And I think that that is um, something that I'm always uh, conscious of and, and probably why I'm still here talking to you, interacting with lions in that way. Or maybe it's the, the, the luck bucket is not run out yet. Maybe it hasn't run out. But I think uh, what, what, what uh, most people who know me well would, would tell you that um, over the years, you, you develop the ability really to, to read the body language and to know, I suppose that the, 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 the talent really is not knowing, not knowing when to interact, but no, knowing when not to interact and giving them their space and being humble around them and being respectful. Um, and I think you can, you, you are... Um, you are uh, walking on a knife edge, um, and it is probably likened a bit to texting and driving, um, and I'm fully aware of that. Um, and, and how do you remind yourself? I, I'll give you another example. I talked to somebody from a British Petroleum, uh, that, and, and he said that basically what happened in oil rigs is similar to this problem, is that if you have an oil rig, he said he thinks that an oil rig should be shut down about three times a week. Um, the small sign of something bad will happen. If something bad will happen, it will be really big. Yes. But the, t the probability is very small. But he said, if you shut the rig down, everybody gets upset with you, and you don't see that you might have saved yeah. a lot of things. But um, if you don't shut the rig down, you get the positive reward that nothing bad happened. And he said, as a consequence, the probability of shutting the rig is actually very low because people are learning from these yeah. bad signs. And his question was, how do you keep people consciously thoughtful about the danger of these small signals? Because you have all of these small signals that many times do not materialize. Sure. Um, so what, what do you do to basically remind yourself all the time that you're dealing, I mean, you know, it seems so social and so wonderful and they yeah. seem to like you, but at the same time, they're incredibly dangerous. How do you keep on remembering how dangerous they are? I think it's a conscious thing that you've got to keep on uh, telling yourself and, and, and the humility. Uh, it really is something that has, has got me to where I am and knowing that they have the ability to kill you with one swap or with one bite, but getting to know them intimately is also the secret. Uh, you know, we're not talking... We're, not, we're talking about uh, beings that are sentient. I mean, and, and, and we know that they have this ability to be truly social. And they don't just go around killing each other because that's not in their best interest. And the fact that, that, that um, they're accepting a, foreign, a foreigner into their, their prides is, is no surprise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you have to uh, keep at the, 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 you know, the top of your, your gray matter. But uh, it's not something that I consciously have to think about or worry about. Okay, so, so you don't go into it and try to assess no. the probability, you just kind of... No, you go with the flow. You go with the, you go with the gut or with, the, with the, what's developed or, you know, tried to hone over the years is the sixth sense and, and try and listen to it. I guess, I guess in 20 years from now, we'll be able to assess whether you really have a sixth sense or not. <laughs> well, I mean, that's an interesting thing because, uh, you know, when the market five years, I was like, people, do, do you think I know what I'm doing? And then it was like, no, you don't know what you go for another five years. Another five years went by, well, I'm still doing what I'm doing is the probability, you know, the probability that I'm going to get it attack less and then I'll, I'll go for another five years. So it's not like going over 16 years um, and yeah, you know, so I think I'll continue doing it and see. Okay, I mean that's, that's a great hypothesis. We'll, yeah. we'll, uh, <laughs> let's, let's talk um, a little bit about conservation. Yeah. So this is clearly something very central to you both in nature and in captivity. What, what do you think are kind of the crucial steps for conservation? What should we 
uh, try to do next? Yeah, the, I think the, the big issues facing lions, and, and lions being an apex predator is a, is a big issue. Uh, it, well, it filters down into all other species, is habitat loss is, is uh, first and foremost. Um, so, yeah, lions are facing, um, you know, um, uh, people encroaching on their, their habitat, and then when the, when the, the uh, lions uh, retaliate and kill livestock, etc., they, you know, people in turn retaliate and kill lions. So it's, a, it's not a win-win situation. We've also got a new a thing that's uh, culminating in the lion bone trade, which is taking over from tiger bone, and it's similar to rhino horn, yep. uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So there's a big issue facing lions. I mean, we've got 20,000-odd lions left in Africa, and if we don't do something about, about it, we, we're actually just starting to see the tip of the iceberg, and we know, all know what's happened with rhino populations. I mean, And elephants. And elephants. So if we don't do something about it, we, we're looking at three of the big five vanishing in the next 20, 15, 20 years. And then I won't even go into, at this point in time, the captive populations and what they're facing, because it's just uh, it's an absolutely sordid industry, and it needs, it needs to be rectified. It's ethically and morally repugnant. So what... what what can be done on the, just like to talk about the ones who are in the wild, what, what are you proposing? Well, wild, wild lions, we need to look at um, uh, restoring habitat, by um, taking down fences, it's a phenomenon in South Africa that's a problem, and uh, letting the lions and animals roam free. So getting, taking out human intervention, letting the animals do what they know how to do. And that, that is really the trick, uh, first and foremost, is to try and buy up habitat, try and uh, um, acquire habitat, and, and try and make communities part of, of, of the whole thing. Because if the communities are not um, benefiting, the lions sure as hell are not. So that, that's where we're focusing, that's where we're aiming, and we, we, you know, we try, we're trying to go down that road.